So welcome. Uh, my name is Andre. I'm the new assistant professor in vegetable cropping system in the Department of Horticulture here at Auburn University. And uh, my talk today will be a little bit of how to use soil moisture sensors to improve vegetable production. I put this chart as uh, as to show you that most of our growers we know the benefits of irrigation. However, we have new tools that are available for us to use it, like soil moisture sensors. And that's the case I would like to make, that we might be using old tools that will not be as beneficial as the new available tools is. So I wanna show you, I wanna show you guys how to properly use that and what are the benefits that those tools are bringing. But before we start you know, talking about the soil moisture sensors, first I will need you guys to understand what are the uh, irrigation scheduling that we have available. So regardless of the irrigation method or the irrigation system you have in your farm or your growers have in your farm, if you are a county agent, uh, I would like to talk about the irrigation scheduling because this is how you're gonna properly apply water for your crop. And regardless of crop, vegetable, um, nursery, or even a row crop. <clears throat> so currently we have six ranks of irrigation scheduling. Those, those ranks, they are uh, according to the how water is applied. So the first rank is to apply water whenever, which means you're gonna apply water whenever you feel that it's necessary. Usually you can go there, you kick the sand, as the dirt comes up, oh, I need to apply water. That's not recommended at all. The second rank is the rank, which is ranked as ranked one, is the fuel and appearance method. This is a USTA method of irrigation scheduling developed back in the 80s, where you're gonna compare the color of your soil with a USDA chart. Uh, and by seeing the color of the, your soil, your soil type and the color, you're gonna and compare with the photos, you're gonna determine how much water you have in your soil, and then you can ap apply water to replace whatever was lost, whatever water was lost. So that's also by your feeling. So it's not recommended. Finally, the third method, which is ranked two, is the systematic irrigation method. This is the most common one used by most of the growers, where you're going to apply water using an irrigation panel. So you have that irrigation panel where you're going to program your water to apply uh, your irrigation system to apply water every day for the same time or every day for the same volume. That is very common. Most of the or growers who irrigate have this system. And it's very common in a, for irrigate in houses where you need to uh, irrigate uh, your grass, but also in your vegetable fields where you have a drip tape. You just program to irrigate every day. This is okay. However, it does some, most of the time does not account for rainfall events, does not account for weather conditions, and that's when it comes to a problem. Finally, rank three, four, and five are the one that we, we usually to recommend because you are applying water based on the crop water demand, which is our rank three, or based on the soil water status method, which is rank four, or a water budget method where you account the crop water demand and the soil water stat, uh, status method, which is rank five. And today we're gonna be talking about rank three, four, and five. So let's start about the crop water demanded method. What it is, also called a crop evapotranspiration, the crop water demanded method, it's a simply calculation of multiplying a reference evapo, uh, uh, evapotranspiration and a crop coefficients. But I don't wanna come to calculation. I want you guys to see what I'm talking about. So imagine you have a field, uh, a field, a corn field, where you have your plants there and then suddenly you apply water. This water can be applied as rain or as irrigation. As water apply, it permeates down in the soil profile. It's uptake by your plant. But our water is also lost by evaporation from the soil. So that is evaporation. When you have water loss by the plant, it's transpiration. When you combine evaporation and transpiration, you have your crop evapotranspiration or your crop water demands. So basically, that is one method. You need to account how much water is lost by the environment, which is your soil, or how much uh, water is lost by your plant. How are you going to determine those values? Luckily, in Alabama, we have the Auburn, like we have the Mesonet, 
the mesonet will provide you the reference evapotranspiration or your ETO. So based on your location on the state, you just select your weather uh, station and you're gonna have that information for you. Once you selected your uh, reference evapotranspiration, which is a daily information in each inches of water, or which means inches of water per day, you just need to multiply by a crop coefficient. That crop coefficient is already calculated by our crop and it's according to the stage of the crop development. Here, I put the crop coefficients for most of the common vegetable crops from bell pepper to yellow squash, going through watermelon, carrots, cauliflower, cucumber, most of our vegetable crop. And how how are you going to determine which crop coefficient to use? It's according to crop coefficient in the initial stage of crop development, in the mid stage of crop development, and in the end of your crop development. So basically, in this chart here, we have the growth. So crop coefficients based on when you transplant your plants in the field or you have seed transplant when you have germination. It's initial. So in the case of bell pepper, 0 0.6. So you're just going to multiply your reference evapotranspiration from the mesonet by 0 0.6. As you have growth, you're going to have your uh, mid, which basically is your vegetative stage, your flowering, and your fruiting. And then you multiply your reference daily evapotranspiration by 1.05. Or in the end of the season, when you have done your peak, but you still have more harvesting, plants are just uptaking water for uh, uh, maintenance. So you're going to multiply by 0 0.9. So it's easy like that. You just need to check online and then you're going to multiply it by a crop coefficient based on the growth of your crop. But how are you going to use that? So you can use the crop, the crop water demand method to calculate water daily. It's more demanding because you need to check your daily water coefficient, uh, your ref reference evapotranspiration, sorry. Or you can do that weekly, where you're going to have a sum of your entire week and you're going to spread it over that week. Or you can do historically, if you get an historical weather data from last year and you can apply this year. So let's see what's happening if we are growing watermelon in the spring season in South Alabama. If you plant March 1, March 15, April 1, and April 15, those are the curves you're going to have of water demand in inches of water per week. So let's just give an, uh, another example, because here we have four planting dates. But if you have an average of those four planting dates, you're gonna have, you're gonna have exactly the amount of water that it required as an average. So let's say in the first week, we just transplant our plant. We need about only 0 .3, uh, 0 0.3 inches of water in that week, because plants are still small we, small, we don't have much water requirement. So we're just gonna have like low water demand. Next week, plants grow a little bit more. So we need 0.36 inches of water. That's just basically on whatever is the plant is losing and how much water your environment is losing as well. But then you have a peak of your growth because our temperatures start to raise. You have more water demand by the plants. They start to grow their vines. They start to flowering. So that's when you have a peak of water. And from the week three to week 10 is when is more critical for you to apply water. So you can apply from 0.9 inches of water up to 0.34 inches of water. So that's what you're gonna consider. That amount, of, that, that volume of water from or 1.02 or 1.14, like you're gonna be applying during the entire week. If you have a drip irrigation system, then you can apply it daily. So you are spoon feeding your plants. But if you have an overhead and center pivot or even stationary gas, you don't need to apply water every day. That's going to increase your cost for uh, electricity. So you can do, you can spread it in two or three applications. The only thing you need to do is divide this number by two or three, which are the, uh, the, the number of applications. And you just apply that amount for that week. You can do that every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, or you can do that Monday, Thursday, and Sundays, whatever it's easier on uh, fit on your scheduling during the growth of your crop. But then we are growing now cabbage in the fall season in North Alabama. So you have a decrease of water consumption. Usually I would ask you guys, what, why do we have that uh, reduction in water demand? But just going straight to the point, water demand is reduced in the fall season. And it doesn't mean that water is for cabbage. It doesn't mean that it's only for cabbage. It's going to be for all the crops 
The reason why is because when you enter in the fall season, you are coming from warmer conditions of the end of the summer to the winter, to the cold conditions of the fall, which means that you don't have much water being lost by the environment. You don't have evaporation. Remember in the first slide where we have this, the sweet corn losing water by evaporation. So here in the fall, you don't have that much water being lost. So your water is not, the water is not much required. It doesn't mean your crop doesn't need water. It's mean you don't have water being lost by the, the environment. On the other hand, in the spring, you come from the cold conditions to warmer conditions. And that's when you have more water required. So just keep in mind, you probably will be irrigating more in the spring and in the summer, during the, in the fall, but it doesn't mean your crop will require less water. It means you are losing less water to the environment by evaporation. So uh, if you guys understood what is the crop water demanded method, that's how you can do that. If you have any question, you can just contact me. We can come through that, or you can easily go to the mesonet and calculate how much water your crop required based on the uh, crop coefficients I presented here. So moving gears to the soil water status method, which is the focus of our talk today, I'm going to be talking about how to properly use uh, soil moisture sensors. But before we start doing that, I need you guys to understand a little bit of soil physics, but I don't take it wrong. It's very simple. So what I need you guys to understand are three main characteristics of your soil, saturation, field capacity, and permanent wilting point. Saturation is when your soil is full of water and you start to have deeper percolation or in extremely conditions, erosion. Field capacity is when your soil is full of water and is the maximum water your soil can hold. While a permanent wilting point is when your soil is dry enough that your plants cannot uptake water. So imagine you have a sponge that you do your dish wash. When you get that sponge there and you put a sponge under the water, and you remove it, it's leaking. When that sponge is leaking, that is saturation point. However, when you squeeze it and there is no water more coming out of that sponge, that your field capacity. Finally, when that sponge is dry enough, that is hard and you can break it in half, that is your permanent wilting point. So now that you know that, basically by field capacity, the water available for for your plant means you have field capacity, it's between field capacity and permanent wilting point. And in this chart here, we have the soil moisture content for each type of soil where you're gonna have your field capacity, the, the top line here, and your permanent wilting point, the uh, dot line in the bottom. So everything below field capacity is unavailable water. Everything above field capacity is saturation and everything between field capacity and permanent wilting point is your available water. And that's what I need you guys to know. know what is field capacity and permanent wilting point. Now that you know those characteristics of soil and you can identify what is your field capacity and your permanent wilting point in this chart, we can start talking about soil moisture sensors. So moisture sensors, there are an array of availability for you guys. You have as cheap as 1050, uh, as $50 with tensiometers or $2,000 as the ones that you can control your irrigation by your phone. And they are very accurate. Those are just some examples that I put here, where to install and how to install that. Those are TDRs and those are more decagons. Those are very good uh, and reliable soil moisture sensors. So they are, are available for you to use. I don't want to promote any company and not talking about soil moisture sensors, but teach you guys how to interpret the data. And that's why I put that graphic here. Although a little bit busy, it's easy to understand what is going on in this graphic. So here we have volumetric water content in the y-axis in days after planting. Here is our rainfall event. And I'm going to explain what are those lines and bars in, your graph, in this graph. So the bars are our rainfall events. Our blue line here represent our field capacity. Our red line here represent our permanent permanent wilting point, and everything between our per field capacity and permanent wilting point is the available water for the plant. The orange line here represents a threshold that we must to determine in order to trick our irrigation event. So usually for vegetables, it's 70 to 80% of our available water. 
For row crops, you can be more flexible because they have a deeper root system. So you can go for 60 to 50% of your uh, available water. But for vegetables, we need to be precise. So that's why we have 80%. So this is 80% of our available water, which is the difference between field capacity and permanent wilting point. So the black line represent our soil moisture. So we start our season. We have two rainfall events. We have a boom of our soil moisture content above our field capacity, no need to irrigate. Water start to be an uptake by the plants or percolation, and then we have an irrigation event. Finally, we have a 0.4 inch of water applied, a little increase of water, we are good, and then water moving down again by uptaking of plants. Then we irrigate 0 0.4, 0 0.8 inches of water, we pick it our moisture up to our field capacity, perfect. We are keeping our moisture, which is the black line between our threshold and our field capacity. Make sure that water is plenty for plants to uptake. Rainfall events are common in our, mainly not right now during the summer, you see how much water we have. So we're gonna have peaks of water content. This means we're gonna need to, to uh, uh, terminate our irrigation for some time until we have the water, the soil moisture coming back for our ideal condition. And here, when we don't have rainfall events or only one rainfall event, it was perfect for us to manage our moisture in the ideal conditions. So that's when we have an ideal condition of soil moisture in the field uh, for a vegetable crop or for any crop where we can control our moisture between field capacity and our threshold, which I also call readily available water for the plants. So uh, what, how should it be? So that period of days here is demonstrated in our field bed here. So imagine we have a, uh, a vegetable bed here, uh, six foot center to center with a drip line in the, in the, in the middle. So this black dot represents our, um, our drip tape and what's going to happen during the day and during the night. So during the night, we don't have much water, water, water going on, but we have irrigate at 8 a.m. So every day we irrigate at 8 a.m., water is being applied and uptake by the plant. So look this case. Right now, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., we don't have much. 8 a.m., water being applied, distributed in the bed, being uptake during the day by the plant. During the night, a little bit of recharge, and then it's not much activity. But again, during the day at 8 a.m., we have water being applied, water moves in the plant, in the bed, and then it's being uptake by the plant. So basically, that's how water distributes in the soil and how should be a proper irrigation management using soil moisture sensors. But what are the benefits of it? So I put a study of case here that we have conducted some years ago in a sandy soil and where we have a fixed irrigation. Remember, I mentioned in my first slide the there where we have the systematic irrigation where you control uh, water with uh, irrigation panels. So that's a fixed irrigation where water was applied two hours continuously to, uh, every day to supply 0.2 inches of water versus a controlled irrigation using soil moisture sensors where water was applied based the field capacity when it reached 80% of our uh, available water, which is our threshold. So just for you to understand, every day from 12 to 2, we applied water with fixed, with fixed irrigation, or five times in the day, we applied water when necessary using soil moisture sensors. What are the benefits? Just saving in water. With the controlled irrigation, we spend about 175 gallons of water per acre, while we spend almost 450 gallons of water per acre. So we reduce it 60% of water using soil moisture sensors. Plus you imagine the save with uh, power that it was reduced. So this is the first benefit of uh, using soil moisture sensors. Second, we start to see different in colors of the plant where we have squash, zucchini as our uh, crop, crop of study. Controlled, controlled irrigation, showed a greener, a darker green plant when compared to fixed irrigation, which it has, was more yellowish. And as you know, this uh, yellowish means nitrogen, uh, lack of nitrogen. So we, you have problems with fertility. And in this case, we saw we sampled plants over the day daily to show how much water was being uptake in the plant tissue. And as you can see in this graph, we have a higher 
uptake of nitrogen by the controlled irrigation, which is the blue dots here, compared to the fixed irrigation, which is the orange dot. So here is the second uh, importance of using soil moisture sensor or the second advantage of that, which is a better nutrient uptake efficiency. Finally, you're going to see increasing of yields because you have a better increase of nutrients where we have an increasing of 26 percent of yield for controlled irrigation so savings in water with savings in uh, pumping savings in nutrients with a better nutrient uptake and increasing in yields that's very important for a grower so these are the main benefits of a water uh, using soil water status method but just to illustrate what's happening in the soil, you can paint in, you can use a blue dye to inject in your drip line. And that's what we did here. So we injected a blue dye in the first irrigation, in the soil moisture, and in the fixed time treatment. As you can see here, 24 hours compared to 24 hours. Three days later, we were still in the root zone with the blue dye on the soil moisture sensor, but it was deeper in the fixed time. You can even see the difference in the soil layer here. Finally, seven days later, we found bloom dye at 60 inch of depth in the soil moisture basin, but 38 inch in the fixed time irrigation. So you can save, imagine that this dye is your nutrient. That's how you explain the better nutrient uptake. With that, I would like to end and show you a take home manage of the importance of irrigation strategies. You can reduce of irrigation water applying. You can maintain or increase vegetable yields by doing a better uh, uptake, uh, nitrogen uptake efficiency or nutrient uptake efficiency. So I would like to say as well that tools for water scheduling or irrigation scheduling are available. You just have to use it. And if you have any questions and you would like any, um, any guidance, I can come and I can help you guys. Just let me know. Thank you.